Uh, so this is the third uh, in our series on variational bays. Um, and today maybe we'll spend a little time on the beyond uh, as well. Um, so we've been talking about scalable Bayesian inference um, and we're gonna continue that today. And I just wanna uh, reiterate this point from the previous lectures that um, already I believe the organizers have shared with you the PDFs of the slides from the previous two lectures. They're also at the link below. Um, so hopefully you have access to all of that. Um, and I just think if you haven't already, I strongly encourage you to work through a few of those exercises from the previous lectures. I think it really helps cement and you know, help your understanding um, with these things to really engage like that. Okay, so let's recap because it's been a few lectures and it's actually been a couple of days now since the last one. Um, remember at the very beginning of the very first lecture, we spent some time motivating, you know, why do we care about scalable Bayesian inference? Um, and in particular, we went through a number of real world examples um, in extremely sort of important and time sensitive, um, you know, especially in the case of, of things like COVID, um, but also other things like, um, you know, finding a lost airplane um, and, you know, fishery management and all of these other areas, but also, you know, generally science and technology, people are using Bayesian inference. Um, they're, they're using it in these very fundamental scientific engineering social science advances. Um, and in particular, the, the things that they're reporting we saw in a lot of these um, applications are, are generally there's some unknown or set of unknowns that they're interested in. Um, and they wanna get a good estimate of what that unknown thing is. Um, generally, we've been calling that the parameter. Um, and they wanna get an uncertainty too. It's important not just to know, you know what do we know, but how well do we know it? Um, there's a very big difference between saying, hey, we think that you know, the effect of microcredit is it raises um, people's profits by something like, you know, 100 US dollars purchasing power parity every week. Um, you know, there's a big difference between 100 plus or minus one and 100 plus or minus 10,000, in which case we really just don't know anything. Um, and we might not want to proceed and make big decisions based on that knowledge. And we said that a big challenge here was that we want to do things quickly and we want to do them accurately. Um, so we said we want to do things quickly in compute time. We don't want to sit around for six months, um, you know, waiting for our algorithms to run, but we also don't want to sit around for six months waiting for a biologist wasting their time driving equations um, when they could have just been doing their awesome, important biology work. Um, and of course, it's so important, again, not to talk about speed on its own. It's very easy to come up with a fast algorithm. It's very easy to come up with a fast and easy to use algorithm. It's very hard to come up with an algorithm that is both fast and accurate. So we have to talk about accuracy as the same time we talk about speed. Okay, and so we wanna have this for Bayesian inference. We wanna do all of these you know, things quickly and accurately. And, and sort of the thing that we've been exploring, and you could do a very similar um, exploration for, for other Bayesian methods is variational inference as a potential method for approximate Bayesian inference, something that will approximate these point estimates and will approximate um, these uncertainties. And we've been focusing on um, posterior means and posterior variances respectively for those point estimates and uncertainties. And so let me just recap something that we already saw, but I think um, sort of encapsulates some of the lessons that we learned along the way. Um, so one, uh, the first, one of the first things we saw um, was that we can't just use math to solve this uh, fast Bayesian inference thing if, if we care about means and uncertainties. Um, I'll, I'll just say incidentally, you could have a really long and interesting discussion about, um, you know, what are the benefits of Bayesian inference? Why do you want means and uncertain or means and variances versus, you know, I think you very legitimately in some cases really care about medians and quantiles and things like that. Um, and there are ways that you even potentially want to get beyond Bayesian inference. And I think these are really interesting questions. And I would say they're outside of the scope of what we're doing right now. We're assuming um, very realistically that many scientists are using Bayesian inference and we're just trying to speed that up. But I, I think those are very interesting and important questions as well. Okay, so supposing we're doing that, supposing we want to get these posterior means and variances, we saw that map isn't gonna cut it. We saw that you can just get these extremely wrong orders of magnitude off answers um, just using map. Um, and so we're, we looked at, you know, could we use mean field variational bays instead, um, a particular type of variational bays as we saw. And we saw much better results, um, at least for, for some of our um, application areas. So we looked at this online ads experiment, 
Um, we looked at, um, you know, this experiment with uh, microcredit data. These are all real data sets and, you know, um, very similar to analyses that you would do in person. In fact, you can even see Rachel Meager's paper for a more complex analysis um, that you would do for, um, for microcredit. And it has many of the similar flavors to what we're seeing here. So in particular, what we're seeing here is that even though mean field variational Bayes doesn't take much longer than that, it's only 57 seconds in this case, um, we find that the posterior means estimated by mean field variational Bayes very much align with the posterior means estimated by Markov Chia Monte Carlo. Um, and remember, we came across this sort of issue of, okay, well, we, we want to know if we're doing the right thing, how do we do that without also running Markov Chia Monte Carlo because it's so slow. Um, so in particular, in this case, it takes six hours. And not only that, but the reason that we're looking at a smaller data set here, because this is not the full size of this full data set, is in order to compare to Markov Chia Monte Carlo. So that's just obviously very limiting. We want to just run the very fast thing, which in this case is mean field traditional Bayes. Um, and so in some sense, we want to know, you know, can we trust in general. Well, certainly, we sort of immediately saw a case where, um, where we pretty, pretty clearly cannot trust it, and that's in estimating posterior standard deviations or a notion of uncertainty. So um, we saw that this just you know, dramatically underestimates these uncertainties in general. So here we're, we're doing the same plot. We're saying you know, each of these dots is one of the parameters. In the top, we split them into global parameters and local parameters. Um, and just to reiterate, global parameters are parameters that are shared across the whole data set. Um, local parameters are things that are specific to data points or you know, a data point or a collection of data points. You know? So something like um, a particular advertiser or a particular ad. And so here we're just collecting um, some of them for the standard deviation or looking specifically at these um, uh, global parameters. It's a similar thing for the local parameters, but we're seeing this underestimation. Um, and, and we saw this in a variety of other cases too, right? So we, we saw similar behavior for the microcredit data. We saw similar behavior for the PM 2.5 sort of illustrative example, um, the air pollution example. Uh, you see this in, in many areas. This is sort of the, the folk wisdom about why people use variational Bayes is that the, the point estimates seem to be pretty decent, um, but it's also well known that the uncertainties um, tend to be pretty bad. Um, and you can see this in a, a multivariate normal example. So here, we looked at an illustration where there were two parameters, a two-dimensional parameter, theta one and theta two. Um, here, we're looking at the contours. There's only one contour, but you can imagine what normal contours look like for an exact posterior if it were normal, that's in green. And then we can look at the contours of mean field variational Bayes. Again, just plotting one contour here, but it, you know, it's normal. You can sort of imagine what this looks like. Um, and, uh, and we saw that, even in this two-dimensional example, and this, this absolutely holds in higher dimensions as well, that you get this massive underestimation of uncertainty um, and that you can make that sort of arbitrarily bad by increasing the correlation and the exact posterior. And the danger here is that you do not know the exact posterior. It could be highly correlated for all you know. Um, and then you'd be in, in some hot water um, based, on, based on what we're seeing here. Again, we looked at lots of different examples. Um, I want to also point out that in this nice graph network data analysis um, by Bailey Fosdick, we actually see that um, the means can be off too. And we saw some more examples of this um, in, in some simulated data. So it's not just an issue of model misspecification. This is really something that can happen that the posterior means can be misestimated. So, um, so these are some of the, you know, the minuses that we spent some time discussing uh, yesterday and really spending some time in a variety of sort of real data analyses and simulated data analyses and just looking at sort of a wide range of data analyses. Um, and so I want to start today by spending a little time digging deeper into that, understanding what's going on here. Um, and then we're going to start talking about some solutions, but I think one of the things that's really exciting about this area is that there are definitely open problems. Now, um, a meta point that I think is really important to make is that I think none of this is specific to variational Bayes. I think if you look at any machine learning algorithm, it has pros and cons. Um, if you do not know the cons, that's likely just because you don't know them. That's not because they don't exist. Um, there's, there's no perfect thing that works in all of the different cases. So there's no perfect algorithm. And so it's, it's always worth spending some time exploring, you know, when do things work and when do they not work? Um, especially if you ever plan to use any of this stuff in practice or if you plan to collaborate 
the people who are really working in practice, um, it's really important to know both the pros and the limitations of your algorithms. And so um, here we're, we, we have a sense of that at this point. We have a sense of some of the benefits of variational Bayes. Definitely the speed is a huge benefit. I mean, there are some things you can just never run um, typical you know, MCMC algorithms on unless you do some very maybe special kind of algorithm. Um, and yet we've also seen some of the, the cons. You know, while it works really well in some cases, it doesn't in others, how do you know which one you're in. Um, and so we want to sort of understand now at a more deeper level what's going on. And so that's what we're gonna spend some time on um, coming up here. So um, in order to start delving into that question, let's just recall this uh, sort of Venn diagram that we had of approximate Bayesian inference and the choices that we had made in this particular lecture, because I wanna emphasize that they're choices. You could make other choices. And I think people already in the chat in these lectures have thought about some really interesting other choices. Some of them um, have been done already, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't brainstorm them. I mean, you know, think about what you're, you know, what you're thinking, come up with cool ideas, and then you know, see if they're out there already. But the choices we made in this lecture was first, we said, let's use another distribution to approximate our exact posterior. We don't have to do that, but that's a choice that we're, we're making for our approximation. We said, let's use an optimization to solve for the exact posterior, not just any optimization procedure, because you could think of MAP as an optimization procedure, but we're using this particular optimization procedure where we minimize some notion of farness across the nice distributions so that we call capital Q, and, and this farness is F. And so variational Bayes, one way to think about variational Bayes is that it's the particular choice of this optimization problem where we use the KL divergence in a particular direction because it's not a distance, it's not symmetric, so we have to choose a direction. So this is one particular direction. And then a further choice is to say, what are these nice distributions? Um, if we make this mean field assumption, this sort of factorizing assumption, and typically, really, in practice, people often make this exponential family assumption, and we get mean field variational Bayes. Um, and then finally, we have a well-defined optimization problem at this point. We have to decide how to optimize so we can come up with an optimization algorithm. And then finally, we have to write it down. We have to actually have an implementation and, and make it happen in practice. We have to code it up. And so we want to start sort of by looking from the bottom up and saying, how deep is the issue? I mean, I think a very realistic question you could ask if something isn't working is, was it just my code? You know, was there just a bug there? Uh, is it possible that um, the only reason that we get these uh, bad posterior uncertainties, for instance, is a bug in the code? And so this is a real question that I'm asking to you as the audience right now. Is it possible that this whole posterior uncertainty underestimation thing with mean field variational Bayes is just due to bugs in the code? Based on the information that you've seen in these lectures, can you, can you conclude one way or the other? Anybody have any thoughts? Okay, how about this? Let's, let's think through the examples that we've seen so far. So we saw in that Critio example um, that the posterior uncertainty was underestimated. That's something that, you know, I just presented some code to you. I just said, hey, I, you know, we ran this and here are the results. And so it seems totally plausible to me that that, that could be a bug without any more information, you know, without you having like derived it all yourself and independently created it, you know, you, you just don't know um, whether that could be a bug in the code. But how about the Gaussian example? Could that be a bug in the code? So I showed you this Gaussian example. Um, we, we took a multivariate Gaussian and um, approximated it using the mean field assumption. And um, I said, this is something you could derive. In fact, I said, this would be a, a good exercise to derive. Don't worry about whether you actually completed that exercise or not. Um, but is it possible that the only reason that we got that under approximation that, you know, let's just go back to this previous slide. So here's this Gaussian example in the lower right-hand corner. Um, is it possible that this mean field variational Bayes approximation looks bad, looks like it's underestimating the uncertainty just because there's a bug in the code? 
Does anybody have any thoughts? I'm seeing some no's. Does anybody want to elaborate on that? I want to remind you a little bit more about this Gaussian example. Um, so in the Gaussian example, I said, you can actually solve exactly for the mean field variational Bayes optimum. You actually don't have to do any optimization algorithm. You don't have to you know, actually make any code at all. This actually isn't based on solving anything in code. You can literally write down the mean field variational base optimum. You can like solve exactly for the exact distribution that optimizes the mean field variational base optimization problem. And so is it possible that there is a bug in the code for this one? Yeah, I, I guess I guess the point that I, I want to make here, and I, I hope some of these um, chat answers are getting at this, is that there is no code. This is a purely theoretical example. And so every time there is code, when you get something that's unexpected, it's at least possible, at least theoretically possible, that it's due to a book. Um, and, and we should be aware of that, that that's a possibility. Um, but in this case, it's not possible I mean, there's a chance that like my derivation could be wrong, but at this point, many, many authors have made this derivation. Um, so David Mackay made it in his textbook in 2003, Bishop made it in his textbook in 2006. Um, it appears in many, many papers. Um, yes, exactly. So there's a point in the chat. We can solve it exactly. It's, it, the issue is not a bug in the code. Um, and so here, at least with the Gaussian example, we have the theory to back this up. And so it's possible that we misderived the theory, but given that so many people have looked over the theory at this point, that seems less likely and there's no code. So there can't be a bug. So it's not an implementation issue. Um, and so I wanna rule out that every problem with you know, mean field variational Bayes that we've seen has been an implementation issue because we could actually solve some exact problems. We didn't have to rely on an implementation. Um, we could actually do, do things exactly. Okay, so what about maybe the issue is the optimization algorithm rather than the implementation? Maybe it's not my code, but I didn't use, you know, I used coordinate descent and actually I would have done better to use some kind of like stochastic gradient descent or something like that. Um, could that be the issue that, right, that, that gives us all these issues where, you know, we see this underestimation of uncertainty and other problems? This Gaussian example, could the issue be due to stochastic gradient descent versus coordinate descent in the Gaussian example? Okay, so I see some no's. Does anybody wanna elaborate on why that is? There's some thoughts, any, any other thoughts about um, why this might be? Re remember how, how we're saying we derived the Gaussian example. Um, did we use coordinate descent? Did we use stochastic gradient descent? What, what, what did we use there? Yes, okay, in the example, we know the exact solution. So this is, this is the really key point. It's, it's basically the same answer as before. Um, so the answer is we didn't use any of these things or we didn't have to. We don't have to use coordinate descent. We don't have to use stochastic gradient descent. This is a case where we can solve for the exact optimum. And so again, 
it can't depend on the algorithm if we can just solve for the solution. So in all the other cases, at least a priori, it's it's possible. Um, you know, there it's certainly the case that some optimization algorithms are more likely to get stuck in the local optimum. You know, um, it's possible that there could be some issues, but that's not the issue here because the Gaussian example was exact. We solved exactly for the mean field variational Bayes optimal. We have this well-defined optimization problem. Typically, we're gonna to have to use some optimization procedure to get close to the optimum, but here we could solve for it exactly. And so we know that at least the issues that we saw in the Gaussian example can't be due to implementation. They can't be due to bugs. They can't be due to choosing different types of optimization algorithm like coordinate descent or stochastic gradient descent or anything like that because we solved them exactly. And of course, once we have that information, it, it seems more likely that the other things are sort of real issues that are going on. Um, you know, we have at least a little bit more evidence in that direction. But this is this is sort of the point of theory, right? To make sure that the things we're seeing are real, to, to check that it's not somehow due to a bug, which is just life. I mean, we all make we all have bugs in our code. Like it's it's unavoidable. And so we want to be able to check in a way that doesn't depend on that. Um, and so this this can help with that. Okay, so, so somebody in the chat already said they think it's um, you know, this mean field assumption. Um, and so that's what we're looking at next. So we've, we've ruled out that it's just an issue with the implementation that we're seeing these you know, underestimations of uncertainties and, and things like that. We've ruled out that it's just an issue with the optimization algorithm. And so the next question is, is it just the mean field assumption? So first, I wanted to spend a second saying why you might think it's just the mean field assumption. I mean, it's something we've seen all along, um, but I want to spend a tiny bit more time on it. And then, and then we'll start getting into, is it just the mean field assumption? OK, so let's, let's interrogate this mean field assumption. OK, is it just mean field, the MF in MFVB? So here, we're just saying MFVB is mean field variational phase. Okay, well, let's, let's go back to this illustration, this Gaussian illustration from before. So this is the KL divergence as we're optimizing it in variational Bayes, the direction that we're optimizing it. And this is the mean field assumption, this, this factorization assumption. Um, again, in general, you're usually assuming exponential families in the Gaussian case, it just happens that you'll get an exponential family, um, but it's, it's implicitly there. Okay, so why do we see this behavior? So let's spend just a moment on that. Well, let's imagine, you know, take, take this first plot, the plot on the left. And look at that sort of lower right-hand corner. Now, if you look at this Gaussian, the green Gaussian, the exact posterior, there's just not much mass in that lower right-hand corner. There's very little mass in the exact posterior due to the geometry of this problem. Now, if you look at the KL divergence, imagine that we looked at a Q. You know, Q is any approximation that we could use, and we're just trying to find the best Q for Q star. Um, if you look at a Q that has a lot of mass in that lower right-hand corner, then you're going to see that we're sort of dividing a large quantity by a very small quantity. And so that's, that could be potentially very big, especially when we have things like Gaussians with these, you know, quadratically exponentially decreasing tails, um, you know, super exponentially decreasing tails. And so, um, and so that could get very large. And then we would have this large KL and that Q would not minimize the KL. And so from that perspective, whenever the exact posterior has very little mass, we're very much incentivized not to put mass in Q there. And so a sort of high level way you can think about this is that somehow KL in this direction is asking us to fit our approximating posterior sort of inside the exact posterior. And so that's why you're seeing what we're seeing here. We have to find an axis line distribution by the mean field assumption that sort of fits inside our exact posterior, and this is what we get. Now, this is this is like a rough version of. There was a nice comment the first day talking about how KL has this issue where you know if the um, the supports don't align, then you could have some sort of division by zero and so on. This is like the the relaxed version of that. So it's not like we're not allowing these to you know have um, more mass in some areas than other areas. It's that we're disincentivized for that to be the best cue. And so in general, you're gonna see this kind of behavior as sort of a, a rough intuition. And certainly that's what we see here. And so by trying to fit that green, that uh, axis line red thing inside the green thing, that's why you end up getting this, you know, worse and worse behavior as the correlation increases. Because how do you fit a tiny little axis line red thing inside this long green strand on the far right? You know, you have to make the red thing very, very small. Um, 
So, so there's this question, um, will the approximations never be accurate? I mean, it's, it's hard to say what does it mean to never be accurate, right? So certainly if this were an axis aligned distribution to start with the exact posterior, then this would be a, a perfect approximation. Um, and certainly that's what we see. In all of these cases, the means are correct. In all of these normal cases, the means are correct. The uncertainties are very wrong though. Um, so in general, I think it's more of a question of suppose you don't know the exact posterior, it's pretty clear that there's nothing that guarantees that you're going to get an accurate assumption here. And there's no reason to suspect that going in, right? I mean, this is a pretty strong assumption. You're making this, um, this axis aligned assumption um, in your approximation. I mean, it's kind of amazing how much I think the, the posterior means are even accurately represented in practice. Um, and I think that's sort of just a really interesting fact that we could probably all understand a little bit more. Okay. So this is why we might think that mean field variational Bayes somehow is to blame, right? Because we're minimizing KL um, and this axis aligned assumption is, is sort of making us fit something that doesn't quite fit inside our exact distribution. And certainly if we could match, if we could match our distribution, if we could say that we could have any distribution and we minimize KL and we can get KL to zero, then we know Q and the approximate posterior or, and the exact posterior are equal. But the problem is that in practice that we're specifically choosing Q to be a set of nice distributions, an easy set of distributions, the distributions that we, we'd like to be able to work with. And so we're never getting KL down to zero and that's where the issues come in. And so let's just look really briefly at, there's this really cool set of research um, by Turner and Sahani. So here, this is just the cartoon from earlier. What are we trying to do in VB? We're trying to find the closest of the nice distributions to our exact posterior. Um, so that's just my cartoon, but Turner and Sahani showed empirically in 2011 that you can have a strictly larger set of nice distributions, but worse posterior mean and variance estimates. So again, typically our nice distributions aren't gonna be the full space of distributions. It's hard to work with that because you have to have this practicality, you have to have this speed as well, but you can make them broader. So for instance, you could allow more interactions, more correlations than a pure mean field variational Bayes assumption. You could have a little more structure and that's what they do in this paper and I encourage you to check it out. Um, but being closer in KL in this direction does not imply that your posterior means are closer. It does not imply that your posterior variances are closer. And so I really encourage you to, to work through an exercise. I believe that you can show with a simple example that this is true that having a smaller KL does not imply that you always have better mean and variance estimates. Okay, and so now we, we have somehow this, the same set of questions, but this is leading us in an interesting direction, but how much worse can the estimates be? Are they really that much worse? You know, maybe they're a little bit worse. Maybe they're not that much worse. And is it possible, again, that it was just the implementation? You know, Turner and Sahani did a bunch of empirical studies here. Maybe they had a bug in their code. And so we always want to ask, you know, could it have just been the implementation or is this really some fundamental thing? Spoiler alert, the answer is it's a fundamental thing. Okay, so we're about to have a discussion that's based on what KL values do you actually see in practice? Um, because remember in practice, you're, you just don't get KL down to zero. Um, that's not typically something we see. Maybe you all will invent some amazing new variational Bayes algorithm that really gets scaled down to zero. Um, but in, in practice, certainly for mean field variational Bayes, you won't see that because again, you're, you're strictly far away from that exact posterior. And even in all of the other methods of variational Bayes that people use, so there's some using mixture models, there's some using this more structured you know, thing that goes beyond mean field, you don't get KL down to zero. And so the question is, first of all, what, what does it mean to have a small KL? And so I'll just note a couple of papers. The second paper um, is our paper, um, but the first paper is a totally independent paper um, that small KLs in practice, the kinds that you see by actually optimizing are, are somehow around 0.5 or bigger. And so we can look at some theory. Let's take any constant C. And our theory shows the following, that you can have a small KL, so in per KL value less than 0.23. So hopefully, you know, this, this first bullet convinces you that that is a, a small KL that you might see in practice. Um, you would be pleased to see such a, a KL. Um, in fact, you'd have to estimate it to even see it. 
Um, and you can have an arbitrarily bad variance estimate, and this does not depend on having more than two dimensions. So it definitely doesn't depend on the mean field assumption. So here's, here's a concrete example of how this can happen. Imagine that your, um, your exact posterior, so that's the P, is a student's T. Now this is a very, very reasonable assumption and for the following reasons. Um, so real life often has power laws um, or it often has heavy tailed behavior. And so here I have a slightly heavier tailed behavior than normal. Um, certainly that's something that people see in all kinds of real life applications. And so that's sort of a realistic situation to be in. And we're gonna look at its variance, the variance of this you know, very simple proposed exact posterior, let's call it sigma squared P. Now we're gonna use as our approximation a normal, a Gaussian. Um, for instance, if you use uh, automatic differentiation variational inference, basically that assumes a Gaussian approximation. This is a really common approximation to make. Um, and so again, I think this is somewhat representative of what you might see in practice, but in a super simple distribution. So if things go wrong in this super simple case, then we'll be worried about the more complex realistic cases. Okay, so we're gonna approximate the student's T with this Gaussian, and we're gonna look at their variances. We can look at the variance of the student's T, and we can look at the variance of the Gaussian. And we can show that just by increasing the variance of the student's T, we can make it so that our actual, our actual posterior standard deviation is arbitrarily larger than our variational Bayes approximation. And the KL is small. So here's the point that the, that's going on here. You come back to you know, your, your person studying microcredit, your, your practitioner that you're collaborating with, and you say, hey, the posterior variance you know, is, um, this is this microcredit effect is 100 US dollars plus or minus one. So we feel very comfortable, like we're, we're super sure that this is really helpful. We know the value of how helpful microcredit is, um, and we're gonna go forward with investing in it. And the observation here is that if you just said, hey, I have a small KL, and so I think I can trust this, um, that would not be warranted. That in fact, it could be that the actual posterior variance, like the thing that you think really encapsulates your uncertainty, if you're being evasion, could be arbitrarily worse. It could be orders of magnitude worse. Um, it could be anything. It could be you know, as, as worse as you could imagine, um, if all you know is the kale. Um, and so that's, that's scary. And this is just a pure theory example. This doesn't depend on implementation. This doesn't depend on optimization algorithm. This is just, we can show that you can have this situation. Okay, and the same thing happens with the mean. So first we wanna be a little bit careful about what it means for a posterior mean to be arbitrarily bad. You can just take any two means that are arbitrarily close, as close as you want them to be, and then change the units so that you say they're super duper far. And so you have to compare the means on the scale of the standard deviations. That's also how you would make actual decisions in practice. You usually say something like, oh, is my posterior mean more than two standard deviations from zero or you know, something, something like that. And so that's really important to be on that scale. But it turns out you can also have a small KL and an arbitrarily bad mean estimate. Now, this is a little bit more of a contrived example. It's still unimodal. It's still one dimensional, um, but we're gonna use Weibull's. So in this case, we can look at two Weibull's, we can compare their means and we can make them arbitrarily bad. Now, this is all just to say that you can have a somewhat small KL and get these arbitrarily bad estimates. Does this mean that all hope is lost for KL? Absolutely not. It might be that if you had an even smaller KL that you would get around this issue, but it does point to a problem. It points to the problem that having a small KL does not imply what you want necessarily about means and variances. Um, because if what we want is to get close to the exact posterior mean invariance, we wanna guarantee on being close to the exact posterior mean invariance. And this just shows that at least for some types of things, you, you're not gonna be able to get that. Okay, so is it just mean field variational Bayes? Well, it seems like at least um, it's not the only thing that variational Bayes itself is implicated as well. So, so certainly this is not to say that the mean field assumption does not add extra assumptions. You know, it certainly adds some extra constraints, um, but the KL itself, the KL in this direction clearly has some issues if our goal is to approximate posterior means and posterior variances. And we should really be aware of that, that we don't necessarily get a guarantee on that just by having a small KL. Okay, so we've asked, you know, when can we trust BB? 
And I think we're starting to get an answer that there are really pros and cons. Um, and if anything, I would say that this is just one aspect of that. Um, there are all kinds of other things that you know we could easily spend like a whole course on. Um, we could talk about uh, multimodality. Here we focused on unimodal distributions. Multimodality is actually an issue as well, um, although that's a very subtle point because there can be pros and cons to to dealing with multimodality with variational bays. Um, but from a unimodal perspective, we've seen that there are some real pros and cons here that it can have issues fitting posterior means and variances. But conversely, there are some problems that it can just activate on that you can actually use it for that you can't really even use MCMC for it. So it's a real trade-off like most things in life. So we can start asking, where do we go from here? Can we improve things? Can we have even better methods than the ones that are out there? And I think this is in some sense really exciting, right? Um, at least for, for people who are really interested in doing machine learning research, um, you know, where, where are the open questions? You know, what, what remains to be done? And I think there's a lot of open questions here, a lot of things that remain to be done. You know, if, if you're purely interested in applying these ideas, I think this is all still really important. You want to know, you know, when can you apply this safely? What are, what are the potential issues that you could run into? Um, but I think now we're going to talk a little bit about not just, you know, getting beyond that for applications, but also what are, what are some interesting directions for future research? Okay, so let's spend a little time on where do we go from here. So the uncertainty problem, even though it seems like the biggest problem with variational bays, in some sense is the easiest to solve. And so I'll just I'll mention, you know, here we saw this is this is sort of a, a the same illustration we saw earlier, but with more, um, you know, just just more contours added to the contour plot. So we have our exact posterior, um, it's a normal, and we have our mean field variational Bayes approximation. We just see that it's underestimating the uncertainty. Um, but something that you can actually do here is completely correct the uncertainty with um, this method that we have called linear response variational Bayes. And I also wanna point out this early work by Opper and Winther in 2003 that really um, you know, precipitates a lot of these ideas. Um, there's obviously less focus in 2003 on modern tools that make this easy like automatic differentiation, um, but it's a very, very cool paper. And the procedure is in some sense very simple. You just run any type of variational Bayes. It could be mean field variational Bayes, but it could be you know, anything else. Um, there are certainly other, other types of um, nice distributions that people look at. If nothing else, there's the stuff in Turner and Sahani, um, but also automatic differentiation uses just Gaussian approximations or other options as well. And then you put a correction at the end. And so this comes from perturbation ideas from statistical physics, but what really matters is what we get out in the end, and it's the following. So V is the sort of bad underestimating uncertainty matrix, covariance matrix that you get out from running mean field variational phase. It's this you know, block diagonal um, you know, thing that we're seeing illustrated here. I is just the identity matrix, so you, you know, get that for free. And H is something we can compute from the model with automatic differentiation tools. And so it's very straightforward. It's something that can be automated. And then you just pre-multiply V by this matrix that you can totally compute. You might be worried about this matrix inverse, but in fact, because of the nature of the problem, typically this will be something that has a lot of block diagonal structure. And so it's not so bad to invert from a computational perspective and you get out a, a, better, a better uncertainty matrix, a better covariance matrix at the end. And in fact, in this case, it's perfect. And so, you know, if we look, for instance, you know, not just at a, um, a synthetic example, if we look at a real life data example, and you can do the same thing with the Critio data or any of the other data we've seen, you can see that while mean field variational Bayes systematically underestimates these uncertainties, LRVB gets some closer to the exact values. So again, this, um, this line is the sort of X equals Y line. It's where VB or LRVB in this case agrees with Markov chain Monte Carlo. Um, so this is totally exact for Gaussians um, because Gaussians get the posterior means exactly. Um, it does need a good posterior mean approximation though in practice. And so to the extent that we have seen on a number of examples that um, mean field variational values in particular, but BB more generally seems to give good posterior mean approximations. This is a great way to get a better uncertainty. Now the open question at this point is, okay, well, but we have seen some cases where maybe we're not totally sure the posterior mean approximation is great. And so what do we do there? And so there are other options there. Um, I'll just mention um, again, some, some interesting directions. Um, so one idea instead is to say, you know, one of the big problems in all of this is that we have sort of uh, too much data, which you know, is, is 
uh, it somehow seems wrong, right? Like data should be a resource. It should be this, this, this great thing that we have. I think there's a whole Michael Jordan talk on data being a resource. Um, and so, so we feel like we shouldn't have such a thing as too much data. Is there some way that we could extract the important parts of the data, but then not have so much that it becomes prohibitive to run our algorithms on it? And so the thing that we just talked about, this linear response for additional bases, like this post-processing step, what if instead we had a pre-processing step that just extracted somehow the core of our data, the really important parts of our data? And so the, the, the key observation here is that we don't need data to be boring and tall, just you know, tons of data with very low dimension for there to be redundancies. Like imagine that I'm working on some sort of computer security application and I have a bunch of packets on my network and you know, some of them are email and SSH and some of them are people maliciously trying to break into my network and do things that I don't want. Um, and so maybe some of these packets are benign. They're totally good. You know, they're again, this reg regular network traffic and some of them are malicious. Um, and I really want to identify probably which ones are which. And so from that perspective, you know, I might say, hey, there's so much network traffic and it's usually high dimensional. There's so much information about every one of these packets um, that this could be a very challenging problem in practice. But then if I look at all of this traffic, I might find that actually there's just a few representative types of each. You know, maybe there's just a few types of benign traffic, again, like email or SSH or, you know, looking at some web page. Um, and maybe there's a few types of malicious traffic as well. And I think that if I ran, you know, if I, if I substituted these, these representative types of traffic and just gave them big weights, and if I ran my algorithm on that, surely that would be very, very fast. You know, I don't, it doesn't matter if I use variational Bayes or MCMC, if I have two or 10 data points, like they're all going to be very fast. And so my, my sort of concern here is, well, yeah, it's going to be fast, but is it going to be any good? And so there's this really interesting idea.